Three flatmates in Edinburgh discover their new fourth flatmate dead in his room. Under his bed, they find a suitcase full of money. At that point, a decision must be made, one that will affect the rest of their lives and define who they are as people. They decide to dismember and bury the body, keep the money, and destroy any evidence that the man was ever there. But money like that changes people, shows you who your friends really are. In Danny Boyle's 1994 directorial debut, Shallow Grave. I'm Connor Azagari. And I'm Austin Johnson. And this is Filmgasm. Happy Friday, listeners. Keeping with the Danny Boyle theme from 28 Days Later, we've got the cult black comedy Shallow Grave as our discussion topic today. A wildly underrated psychological thriller that really shines in character development above all else. It's a bonkers movie upon a first viewing and just gets better every time you watch it. So this was your first time with Shallow Grave, right? Yes, indeed. I'm very glad you chose this one because... It is, to me, the quintessential bonus for this podcast. It's got (laughs) it's got a really interesting cast, a director that we both have an attachment to, of course, from 28, 28 days later. Uh, And then this is a movie that comes before that. So we love doing that on this podcast is what do we love? And then let's find out what they did before that to get there sort of thing. We love doing that. This movie is very funny. It's dark as hell. It kind of feels like a Cohen movie at times. It's fucking great. I'm really glad you uh, yeah you suggest this one. It's it's a perfect bonus. Kick ass, man. And uh, we had intended to do Train Spotting, but this worked out in our favor because I think this is a much better pairing. For 28 days later. Agreed, agreed. And Train Spotting will have its day on Filmgasm. Oh, for sure, for sure. I mean, why wouldn't we want to talk about the heroin scene of Scotland? <laughs> or or yeah, or just you and McGregor over and over. Yeah. <laughs> oh, dude, Robert Carlyle. Hell, that'll probably be our bonus for 28 weeks later. <laughs> There you go. (laughs) So Shallow Grave was directed by Danny Boyle. It was his first movie. He started with this, which is (laughs) unbelievable. He'd go on to do Train Spotting, The Beach, 28 Days Later, Sunshine, Slumdog Millionaire, 127 Hours, and Yesterday, among others. He's a great filmmaker. The guy tells tells a great original story. He's so good at picking his projects. Yeah, and uh, of course he's the mas- like one of the masters of bringing the you know the British British films to America, and making it making them very very mainstream, and not to mention his uh, his involvement with guys like an actor like Ewan McGregor, where he just puts him on a pedestal and keeps giving him these wonderful roles. Um, yeah, it's yeah he's huge for uh, fans like us. It exposes us to a completely different culture different lingo, different language, different, you know, different beats. It's awesome, man. This was you and McGregor's debut film too. This is, uh, yes, yes. They came up together, him and Danny Boyle. Exactly. McGregor plays Alex, the obnoxious prick who comes up with the idea to keep the money. McGregor would be one of Boyle's key players for a while, broke out big time with his starring role in train spotting. From there, he was cast as Obi-Wan Kenobi in the star Wars prequel trilogy and became a star. Some of his other significant roles include Moulin Rouge, Black Hawk Down, Angels and Demons, The Ghost Rider, Season 3 of Fargo, and recently as Dan Torrance in Doctor Sleep. McGregor, I feel like we've talked about him a bit in the Doctor Sleep episode, but he is just, he's so talented. (laughs) Ewan McGregor. Yeah, yeah, he really, yeah. And, you know, I'm not even a big fan of Star Wars, but he probably plays my favorite character in the entire fucking thing. Um He's he's like actually really good good at it. He's going for it. He's really trying to act in those yeah. movies. But uh, somebody has to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Especially in those. Uh, and uh, <laughs> but I feel a personal connection to the Stussy, the Ray and Emmett Stussy from Fargo season three, yep. playing playing the twin brothers. Just magnificent stuff from him uh, throughout that entire season. Yeah, he's awesome, man. I recently. Uh, I thought his turn as Black Mask and Birds of Prey was fantastic. He's one of the best, best parts about that movie. I think he is he, t- now since that movie is, you know, it's been a while since I saw it in theaters. He's what I remember for sure. Yeah. He's he's <laughs> wicked funny. That that one scene when he's like, oh, never mind. <laughs> Killer. <huh? laughs> you know, he's just yeah. uh, he, he can do it all. He can. all. Uh, did you see um, Christopher Robin? 
I, I liked Christopher Robin a lot. Lovely that was a movie. Very cute movie. Yeah, lovely movie. He can do it all, man. He can be yeah, he can be menacing as hell, and then he can just be like your your best buddy. Yeah. I love him in Angels and Demons. That's such an understated performance. But just I have you seen Angels and Demons? Oh yes. Okay, so you know about the the twist. Yes. The Dan the the signature Dan Brown twist of the good guy is the is the really the bad guy the whole time. <laughs> Every yeah. time he does that, it's gotten kind of annoying. But Angels and Demons, it's so out of the fucking blue. And really, like, on repeated watches, you, you see that character in a completely different light every time. And I just, yeah, I love it. The guy's, like, like you said, he's the best part of the Star Wars prequel trilogy. And he's one of those actors where if I see his name listed, I'm going to watch the movie. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, well, here's the thing. Here's the thing about Ewan. <laughs> <laughs> he, he tends to work and choose you know work with people that i like he worked with he worked with noah holly you know he decided to do dr sleep which is like well i'm gonna see that no matter who's in it and he happens to be in it he's making these awesome choices and like you said he starts out with danny boyle and this and train spotting he's just good at choosing shit very true have you seen the men who stare at goats oh man i we have we have got to bring that up as a bonus one day that's the weirdest fucking movie but it's so entertaining hell yeah hell yeah yeah, him and uh, Clooney play off each other. Fan- just so great. But uh, yeah, he's he's great in this as kind of kind of the the bad guy or one of the bad. They're all bad guys pretty much. This movie doesn't have a hero. <laughs> and uh, from the get go, oh no, no, you don't they're like all him. yeah, they're all ter- terrible. <laughs> but you do <laughs> <laughs> because you because you're like ah fuck this guy, but I I want him on the screen. Yeah. <laughs> uh. <laughs> This was an early role for Christopher Eccleston as well, who plays David, who goes from shy accountant to disturbed psychopath over the course of the film. Eccleston also appeared as Major Henry West in Wednesday's Topic, 28 Days Later, and is known for talking shit about paycheck gigs, but cashing the check anyway. And uh, David is such a great character, because I I totally understand. I I get it the whole time. It makes perfect sense. He's just, you know, a beat-down accountant who's just, you know, boring doesn't think he's worth it. He stumbles onto this treasure. He's scarred for life by having to cut this dude up. And it just digs further into his brain, turning him into a complete psychopath. It's such a brilliant turn. I I love it. I it's, For me, he's the most engaging piece of this movie. Yeah, and he's definitely the backbone of it. He has the most he uh for a char- he has the most development, like you said, he loses his mind <laughs> and starts starts taking action in crazy ways. Yeah, really really uh diverse uh performance from him. He's all over the place doing all kinds of shit and he he changes so much throughout the film. It's hilarious. The fucking power drill when he's just like <laughs> right up to his head. Jesus Christ. <sighs> Shallow you know, grave, it's, man. <laughs> it's your roommate losing his fucking mind. It's crazy. Well, and finally, Carrie Fox plays Juliet, who seems like the level-headed member of the trio, but also succumbs to greed. Fox is a New Zealand actress who has stayed in the indie scene. She's been working steadily, but has not really appeared in anything else, I would say, significant outside of uh, possibly England. I'm not sure. But uh, yeah, she's kind of just been in the background for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, I, I think she's great in this. I really wish, uh, wish I'd seen more, more stuff with her in it. Me too. Me too. She's, she's so two faced in this. Yes. Yeah. She yeah. acts like she's, you know, the person who, who we can all trust to do the right thing. But then in the end, she's like, well, fuck you too. And takes off. Like, oh God. Shallow Grave has an IMDb score of 7.3 Rotten Tomato score of 69%. He's kind of low, I think. Fuck you. <laughs> it was the most commercially successful English film of 1995. But it didn't really get much of a release outside the UK. Still, its success gave Boyle the chance to do Train Spotting, which launched his, launched his career as a director. So that's pretty much what this movie was. It was the jumping off point for, for Danny Boyle. And it's since garnered a cult following. It's in the Criterion Collection. Yes. So, People, yeah, fans, uh, critics and fans alike enjoy this movie. Yeah, it's it's understood that this is um, 
<laughs> one of one of those things that you look at the budget, how small it is about two million dollars. You look at that and you're just kind of uh, when something is made that good, people understand Mo- movie people. I, I think that includes you and I understand like what it takes to make a really good movie. And sometimes when you don't have enough money, that's what it can be. That can make the difference. And so when someone gets their vision done like this in Shallow Grave so well and the ending is so awesome, like just props to him, you know. Oh, for sure. So let's get into the plot of this thing. Uh, this movie starts out pretty uh, ferociously. It just kind of like opens on some narration and then you're just zooming through the streets of Edinburgh. You're a 20 year old, 20 something year old living the high life of Edinburgh. Life doesn't matter. It's just fun, 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 excitement all the time. It's whatever you make it. That's the vibe that we get from the beginning. Like these are three people who just don't give a fuck. <laughs> They just don't. And it's weird that, like, so David is an accountant. He's a chartered accountant. Uh, Alex is a journalist. Juliet is a doctor. Like, how how the hell did these three people end up in this situation? Like, why are they living together? Yeah, and you you wouldn't think that especially a, a doctor would need two flatmates, right? Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's mostly what I'm asking here. Like, she's a doctor. Okay, yeah. She doesn't need shouldn't she be making decent money yeah a journalist could go here or there you know depending on you know what's going on and the accountant you would think would have a decent you know steady income yeah it's it's pretty confusing like but whatever it's it doesn't really matter <laughs> yeah we buy it and they're in need of a new flatmate they need a fourth and they interview some applicants in kind of a dick way they're just kind of asking kind of? random <laughs> It's pretty, yeah, it's pretty dickish. <laughs> well, uh, hold on. Just imagine <laughs> if you, myself, and, you know, Josh or Caleb were asking, we're doing this. If we we're interviewing people, like, hey, let's we'll see if you, you know, if you want to be on the, you know, be on film guys. I'm like, that would just be such a dick douche move. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to sleep. I wouldn't be able to sleep at night just from that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's kind of weird because, I mean, when you think about it, we did interview we we'll get we'll get to that (laughs) yeah we'll we'll, we'll go we'll go there later yeah yeah but um yeah they talked to this guy cameron who's this like short redhead guy and they're just like who the hell do you think you are that we would want to hang out with you (laughs) and he's just like uh i just need a room and they're like well fuck off (laughs) it's it's a great introduction to their characters like and david who's supposed to be this like, you know, level-headed accountant. He joins in like there. I feel like he's the butt of the jokes, but if they get a fourth, he won't be anymore. That's the vibe I get. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> God. So they do this to a, a lot of people until they meet Hugo, this mysterious kind of suave guy who comes off as neat and kind of cool and definitely you know, mysterious. They don't know what he what he does. They don't know who he is, but they like him, and they decide to give him the room. And at dinner, they're just asking him all sorts of questions. And somebody, I think David, asks him, "Have you ever killed a man?" And he's like, "No," nah. <laughs> like very kind of noncommittally. No. Nah. <laughs> like like it, like it took a couple seconds. A no that makes me think he's he's killed a man <laughs> for sure. It, yeah, like. I almost it, it basically yeah it's a yes it's basically a yes if you take more than you know two seconds to say your answer yeah you <laughs> killed somebody come on now we've seen oh, enough yeah. movies we've seen enough movies at this point <laughs> uh, and we see a brief flashback of Hugo and another guy beating the fuck out of a dude in an ATM and robbing him and uh, shortly after Hugo moves in there's this uh, they. They don't know what happened to him. His car's still outside, but he hasn't left his room in like a week. So they look into the window they, of his room. They see the keys still in the in the lock. So they force the door open, and they find him dead in his bed. And uh, synopsis says an apparent overdose. I always thought it was a heart attack, but I don't know. Regardless, Hugo's dead, and Alex immediately starts rifling through his stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like no hesitation, just like, let's see what's in here. And he go he goes under the bed, he finds a suitcase, he opens the suitcase and finds it full of money. 
just pounds of pounds. <laughs> and uh, uh. they <laughs> thank you. I'll be here all week. They have a decision to make. Like, do we call the cops? Do we turn this in? Do we wash our hands of the situation? Or, and hear me out, <laughs> do we carve up the body, <laughs> bury it somewhere, and keep the money? And it takes them a while to come to a conclusion. And David, meanwhile, goes to work. He has, like, he gets to put on a big job, a big client. And the guy's like, you know what? His boss is like, I like you. You know why? Because you get shit done. And that makes David think about, like, yeah, you know what? I do get shit done. I'm a, I'm a go-getter. Why don't I deserve that money? And they all decide together, all right, let's let's conceal the, the let's conceal the body let's keep the money and they really like they they go through the most like the most sickening way to discuss to discard the body they could have just like chucked it in a river somewhere they could have buried it whole like deep in the woods but they have to carve it up and that's just vicious and they do that to hide the identity of the body they remove the hands and feet and they draw straws to see who has to do this. And David, who repeatedly said, I can't do this, draws the short straw. And they make him carve up the body. And it's pretty gross. And that's, this is one of the bits where the movie shifts into full-blown horror. The soundtrack turns very dark and sinister, and you just see David sawing into a corpse. And it's so... Ugh, the noises of just, you know, the c- 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 carving is so grisly. <laughs> Yeah, and it, it, it forces you as the audience to, like, you're, at that point, you think you're in for one movie, and you are, like, unwillingly, in, like, injected with this, <laughs> with this, with this horror element. You're like, oh, I guess this is happening now. You know, there's, there's nothing you can do as the audience but keep watching. And yeah, like you said, it, it doesn't make sense that those noises would be within what we've already seen in this movie, but that's what I, I love about it. It, it bends Ben's genre, you know? It's awesome. Prior to this, though, I want to talk about the scene where they go shopping oh, for supplies. Also, also, yeah, that and when they kick the door in. that When they're, like, discussing how they're going to kick Hugo's door in is hilarious. <laughs> oh, you want to try it, then? <laughs> Come on, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. These people. But while they're shopping, like, they're just, they're buying tarps and shovels. Like, <laughs> If I was the checkout guy at this store, I'd be like, oh, these people are going to dispose of a body. Like, very clearly, that's what this is for. What else could it be? Yeah. Alex isn't even being nonchalant about it. He's like, so this is what, like, so you can't carve up the corpse? Is that what you're saying, David? Like, loudly in the store, just like, so you can't do it, right? And David's like, hey, 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 quiet down. This is personal. (laughs) Fuck, man. Like, Alex has a death wish. (laughs) Ugh. But that's when we find out David's squeamish and he doesn't want to do this. But he ends up having to be the guy who does it. And it completely destroys him. It turns him like it erases his personality and turns him into a violent motherfucker. And uh, Juliet disposes of the hands and feet in her hospital's incinerator. They bury what's left in the woods. Yes. David insists they make the grave deeper. Alex says it's fine. And uh, during all this, Hugo is being sought after by two guys who are torturing and murdering people as they try to find where Hugo went. They want the money. And uh, they go to a wedding. I think it's a wedding. Not a wedding. Some kind of celebration. Some kind of dinner. And (laughs) Alex is acting like a complete prick. Just yelling out shit at people. And uh, this one guy comes up to Juliet to talk to her and interrupts David. And David goes off on the guy. It's out of character, and it's your first glimpse you get that he is not the same guy we saw earlier. He's changing, yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes. He's changing into a dangerous person. <laughs> Alex thinks it's hilarious, and he gets beat up by that Cameron guy later on. I love that bit. Cameron, the, the, the redhead, is uh, serving drinks at this dinner, and Alex calls him over. And when he gets him over, he's like, oh, sorry, I thought you were someone else. <laughs> what <Yes>. an asshole. <laughs> uh. and, and Cameron and the rest of the waiters beat the fuck out of him in the bathroom. <laughs> uh. 
So to feel better, Juliet suggests spending some of the money. So they have a spending spree where they just buy a bunch of useless shit. They buy the video cameras. I've got a baby doll. And they're just like, you know, kids who found their dad's gun. They're just, you know, no, uh, not thinking about the consequences, not thinking about the future or what this would look like. And David points out, you know, he asked how much did they pay for the video camera? And they say 500 pounds. And uh, <laughs> David says, like, he says something like, you paid 500 pounds, but we don't know what it cost us yet. I love that line. <laughs> Man. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. So after the apartment below them gets broken into, they get really anxious. The police show up and start talking to them. They heard that they had three roommates, but David's like, oh, no, I only have two roommates. And the cop's like, oh, is that so? I heard differently. Better write that down. Like He knows everything from the get-go. How he oh. knows everything, I don't fucking know. <laughs> and uh, David, after all that, goes full-blown paranoid. He takes the money, goes up to the attic, and stashes it in, a, I think, like the water, heat, water heater. Some like a wooden box of water. I'm not really sure what that was. It, just weird that the water, if it is the water heater, why is it made of wood? <laughs> it's a cheap apartment. Very. That, again, why a doctor is living here makes no sense. <laughs> I have no idea. Maybe she's like a like an intern, like the first couple seasons of Scrubs or something. <laughs> that would that would explain everything. <laughs> And uh, David puts the money in a garbage bag, duct tapes it up, and puts it in that tank, and then starts living in the attic. He calls out from work and just stays in the attic, drills holes in the floor so he can watch every room. Like, <laughs> creepy, this guy. Like, what's yeah, he going to do? He, he's, not, he's not who we were introduced to at all. And also... I mean, Alex kind of has a point about the money. Like, why did you do, go through all of this if you're not going to spend any of it? Like, you're literally just hoarding a case of money and losing your mind. There's no point to that. Yeah, this is this is getting ridiculous. We're all going to die. If we... <laughs> yeah. Well, and they all three start becoming distrustful of each other. They start playing one against the other. They are just they went from roommates to enemies really quickly because of this this money and the men who are after Hugo find their way to the flat and they break in and they fuck up Alex and Juliet big time. They oh, tie yeah. them up. Uh, they, t they put a bag over Alex's face and beat the shit out of him. And they don't even ask him a question. He just screams. It's in the loft <laughs> without like, Oh my God. <laughs> and they go up to the attic, not knowing David is up there and he kills them with a fucking hammer. Jesus. Easy. Yeah. Gets one of them in the head. The other guy goes up to investigate, gets him in the head too, and then just drops the bodies. <laughs> like it's nothing. Then he drives the bodies to the woods and dismembers them too. Dan buries them deep. <laughs> and Alex and Juliet are like, fuck, what do we do? We don't know this guy anymore. What is he capable of? And that's when we get the scene with the power drill where David shows up. After uh, Alex and Juliet try to make off with the money, <laughs> David puts the fuck, fucking power drill to Alex's forehead and drills a little bit. Yeah, little t nice little nice little dab. Yeah, Ugh, creepy. David becomes convinced that they're conspiring against him, and the cops are already on to them. They know something's up. Juliet buys a ticket to Rio <laughs> to flee the country. She's going to take off. But in order to get the money, she starts to seduce David. Ugh. Nobody has any goddamn self-respect in this movie. Uh, oh, my God. So things get serious when the bodies are discovered in their shallow graves. And it uh, turns out David was right. Should have buried him deeper. <laughs> and Alex gets he's he works for the newspaper who gets and he gets sent to cover the story. And he is not paying attention at all. He is super nervous. And the cops can tell. He comes back to find Juliet and David are moving out. <laughs> they're 
taken off. David just has the suitcase full of money like it's nothing. Like, he could just take off with this. Yeah, oh, really? Okay. Somewhere along the line, it became his money. <laughs> and uh, Alex is like, so this is it, huh? You're just, just taking off? <laughs> and Juliet's like, well, I didn't want it to be this way, but it's got to be this way. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> Just and, yeah, uh, they, don't, they they clearly clearly never never were friends. No, they were you know roommates, flatmates. They're flatmates, yeah. They tolerated one another, but they were never friends. Friends could never do this to each other. Well, um, and, um, <laughs> we'll David talk about that later. Yes, David confronts Juliet about the plane ticket. She found it, and Alex in a grand gesture, covers for her, says it was his plane <sighs> ticket, that he bought one for them, and he was going to, it was his idea to take off. Brilliant. That night, Alex tries to call the police, the cop who talked to him, but he doesn't answer his phone, and David and Juliet tell him, you know, hey, who are you calling at this hour? <laughs> and he's like, uh, sex line? <laughs> like, just trying to cover. Not very good. They all start arguing, and it turns into a fight. David, yeah, David picks up on Juliet's uh, seductive attempts, punches her. Alex jumps David and is like, you shouldn't have hit her, and starts beating the hell out of him. They start attacking one another. It's crazy. The fight goes into the kitchen. Knives get get out. And it just, it go, it just keeps getting escalated. And uh, ugh, during the battle, David stabs Alex in the shoulder with a big old knife. Is going to kill him. Juliet stabs David in the throat from the back, kills David. Oof. <laughs> Incredible Crazy. stuff right there. That, that That's where we get some of the best direction right there. How the Just sheer amount of stuff that's happening right in front of the camera. It's awesome. Big time. So now David's dead, and Juliet betrays Alex, hammers the fucking knife further into his chest. Oh, my God. Cold. Tells him he can't come. Pins him to the floor with the knife. Flees ah! the airport. Yeah, he's screaming. I'm <laughs> screaming. That looked incredibly painful. Yeah, it, you can hear the like. Oh, you can hear the 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 the, the blade just kind of slowly <laughs> digging. Oh, it's terrible. Ugh. So she grabs the suitcase of money, takes off to Rio. She gets to the airport, realizes that she's been fucked over, and the case of money is filled with newspapers. <laughs> she's Brilliant. sobbing hysterically. She's killed. She's killed a man. Left her. Left her other roommate to die for nothing. There's no money. <laughs> and uh, she knows she's gonna be wanted for murder. So she gets on the plane. She fucks off with nothing. The police show up at the flat. They find Alex amazingly still alive, bleeding, pinned to the floor, grinning. The camera pans down to reveal. Alex hid the money under the floor. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. They're all going to prison, though. He's never going to get that money. <laughs> oh, no. He's just glad that uh, he didn't lose. They all did. Yeah. They're going to get... Uh, they're going to find the money. The cops are going to find the money. And, yeah, this is all just one big cock up. Big time. But <laughs> but what a movie. <laughs> yeah. When, when... Oh, man. They, they, there's so many times they could have taken a course of action that would have made things so much easier on them. They just yes. decided it. They decided to each uh, try to like pull their own weight and do their own thing, and it yeah just never never worked out. One bit that really creeped me out was when David calls in sick the first time, and he's talking to his boss about his mother. The coldness in his voice, like just the way he so effortlessly lies there. I don't know why, but that's that unnerves the fuck out of me. Just, I think from there you get to see just what is David capable of now? Like how far yeah. is he willing to take this? And it turns out he's willing to take this pretty fucking far for, for nothing though. He has no intention of spending this money. It's almost like a trophy to him. Like he did that horrible act and he needs to have something to show for it. Yeah. Like he, he's never going to spend the money because then he won't have it anymore. It's, it's weird. Fucking accountants. Fucking accountants. 
Can't trust him. No, you can't. You can't. You can't. <laughs> so naturally, with a film like this, you think about how you would fare. What would you What would you do if you and your friends stumbled onto a dead body and a bunch of cash? Well, let's brainstorm. So <laughs> I'd like to think we've all gotten to know each other pretty well, the Filmgasm team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, even even though I haven't met two of them uh, yes. in person at all yet. And I only met Josh recently through Skype. Yeah. But I feel like through our texts and our social media interactions, we we know each other pretty well, I think, at this point. Yeah, and just by – we definitely know each other um, uh, as far as, like, movie language goes, for sure. We definitely know what each other likes. We know, like – Oh, this is his kind of thing. This is what, you know, be th- through how many reviews all of us have done for sure. And just, uh, yeah, now that Josh has been a voice and uh, will be on the podcast in the future, it's, uh, yeah, things are looking cool for us. Yes. And so let's try to put ourselves in shallow grave. How would we fare? What would we do in this situation? Okay. Let me let me first ask these these base questions because I thought about this a lot today. <laughs> okay, so you have three flatmates, correct? Yes. And then you have a you have a fourth one come in, right? Yes. So I'm thinking there's four of us. There's got to be three, and there's got to be a fourth one who comes in and dies and had the money. So which one of us is Hugo? Well, I hate to say it, but I, it's Josh. He he came in the most recently, so okay, he's Hugo. okay. So Josh is Josh <laughs> is Hugo. So that means <laughs> that Sorry, means Josh. I that means I'm a doctor, you're a journalist, <laughs> and Caleb's an accountant. <laughs> Why do I have to be Alex? <laughs> well, I I don't want to be I don't want to be the doctor who lives in a shitty apartment. I don't want to be any of them. I don't want to be the possible sociopath journalist. Well, do you, do you want to be the guy who actually goes crazy and starts murdering people over and over? But I kind of. <laughs> I. Okay, hold on. Let me ask before you say. Do you relate to David? Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> boy, uh, how do I answer this without sounding like a fucking freak? Um, we've gone. We've 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 gone there before. It's okay. <laughs> I relate to aspects of David. I am a little. I'm shy a little bit. I understand kind of blending into the background and I can understand being like the kind of the guy of the group who doesn't really say much. I can, I can feel, I can relate to that. Okay. You can, you can relate to David. Like you can relate to Milton from office space. It's there, but it's not there, you know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I will also be here all week. Fuck. Yeah, I'm uh, okay, okay, okay. So, no, well, that isn't, you know, it's our situation, so it, we don't need to be, you know, those characters. So it's just you, Caleb, and I living together. Okay. In a fl- in a flat here in here in Texas, I guess, right? Uh, and Josh comes in and he either overdoses or has a heart attack. <laughs> I don't know, and had a bunch of money. Uh, so yeah, uh, what would you do? <sighs> See, I like to think. I do the honorable thing, but if you, if I stumble upon a situation where I, there's a suitcase full of money and I could logically get away with it, I'd, I'd take it. Okay. All right. Well, here, here's what, here, here's, I'm with you. I'm with you. <laughs> I, I think we take a sum of the money, not all of it. And then we report it to the police as fast as we can. I think we just take the money and then report it to the police. There was no money. We didn't find any money. Maybe he stashed it in a bank somewhere. Okay. Okay. That's fair. That I agree with you. I guess ah, it's just hard knowing in hindsight, especially after seeing all of Shallow Grave, that c- people are coming after Josh. You know what I mean? Yes. So, it, of course, we wouldn't already know that. But I think, I don't know. I, I would think if I saw Josh in a giant suitcase of money, I would be like, hmm. That might not be like just his, you know what I mean? Like uh, that kind of money doesn't disappear without people looking. Eh, for it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I don't think a guy like, you know, purposely over, you know, does a bunch of drugs to overdose when that kind of money is just laying there, unless it's a problem. So I don't know. That's that's partly why I would like let's just take some of it, or I don't know. But then 
I don't. It's tough, man. It's really tough. <laughs> well, I can't believe that in the movie they didn't just split it three ways. That that's the big. Oh yeah, of course. Me, you, and Caleb would split it three ways, right? I mean, we, yeah. <laughs> I hope so. I I but hope so too. I don't. Look, I've known Caleb for for years now. <laughs> he's like kinda, what? Hmm? He's like, well, I knew Josh the longest. <laughs> Well, I can, I can see him kind of snapping like David. I can see that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> interesting. I'm going to have a discussion with him about this later. I just know it. But um, <laughs> I don't know. I just, I can picture him kind of losing it. But the weird thing is I can kind of picture myself doing the same thing. I I can picture myself getting a little, little too, little too arrogant and being a little bit like, uh, uh, what's her name? I can't remember her name. Juliet. Uh, yeah, I, I not not as selfish as she would get, but I might do things like I'm, I might spend maybe a little too much on something or might like be a little lazy how I'm spending it. And not really yeah. like track my. Yeah, I might, I might be, do something like that. I don't know. See, I know that I would be too afraid to spend the money. I would be too afraid to draw attention to myself. I would probably hoard it like David did. Yes. Yeah, see, I would immediately be like, all right, I'm, uh, you know, traveling to Los Angeles, California, and I'm going to go do this, do that, you know, that kind of stuff. What I would do is I would go straight to New Mexico and invest in laser tag. <laughs> <laughs> got to launder that shit. <laughs> Let's see. We got we got Danny Boyle on the table. We got Vince Gilligan on the table. What else can we do? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. But, yeah, I just think that there's no real way to win here. Because you, no. you either do the right thing and you're poor – or you do the wrong thing and you completely lose your identity. <laughs> okay, let me ask you this. Yeah. As time moves along, say say we do split the money three ways, me, you, and Caleb, straight up. Even uh, we're each doing our own thing with it, but we, we still remain in the flat. Uh, let's say we hear that people came after the people downstairs. What what do you? How do you react to that? Would you be like, oh, maybe they're after the money we have? I would immediately think that yes. I would immediately and, get paranoid about everything happening around me. And I, I would I would want to be on the same page as you and Caleb and be like, we're getting the fuck out of here, right? Like, all three of us are moving, like, getting the fuck out of Dodge. Like, sorry, not even saying bye to, you know, mom and everybody, just leaving, <laughs> you know? Three-way ticket to Rio. Again, if they just worked together here, this movie would have ended so much more amicably, but they all went individually nuts. <laughs> yeah. No. Group insanity works better in this situation. <laughs> yeah. I like it. Let's go to Rio. Let's go to Brazil and yeah, start our own community. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. I think also, as the movie establishes, they're not really friends. They're just tolerating one another. We're friends. So I feel like we would handle it better. Yeah. OK. okay. That, that also asks the question of, yeah, if you were with two strangers, you know, what would you do? And that's that changes everything, of course. Yeah. Uh, and that's yeah, that's what makes Shallow Grave so fucking funny. Yes, indeed. This was very interesting. I give Shallow Grave an eight. It's a great thriller, solid comedy that slowly evolves into full-blown psychological horror. All three leads are fantastic, and I think the film should get more attention. Agreed. I also give it an eight, but I do think it's a movie uh, for myself. I think it's in my wheelhouse. I think it's something that I could watch over time, rewatch, rewatch, and it push up to a nine possibly kind of thing. Uh, just has a lot there. There's things I'm sure I'll, I'll catch next time. And uh, yeah, like uh, great performances and uh, underrated direction from Danny Boyle in this one. I know he has a lot of like, you know, really, really impressive films in his filmography, but this one is awesome. Oh, he started strong. That's for sure. Yes. It showed us the kind of director he was going to be. <laughs> and he hasn't stopped since the guy's been delivering quality work for almost 30 years now. Yeah, just about. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah. Way to go. So we got some time here. Um, what are some let's shine a spotlight on some films we've been watching lately stuff to keep us occupied during the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good idea. I think, um, we both are using, using our time wisely. If we, if you can at this time, uh, watching a lot of stuff, just trying to stay entertained, stay positive. And I know for you and I, our way to escape is to watch movies. Yes. Um, and, uh, for me, not being able to go to the theater has just made me want to watch more movies for some reason. I don't know. So yeah, I've been watching a lot of stuff. Of course, I've been been heavily uh, on the um, Criterion channel, and I would say 
the most recent thing I watched was actually uh, Kelly Reichardt's Wendy and Lucy from 2008. Uh, Kelly Reichardt recently had First Cow, uh, which is one of the like to me one of my most anticipated movies of this year. I'm really excited to see it whenever I can. Uh, I think she has a fantastic eye for for the normal, for the working class people, the just normal folks out there. Uh, I, I wrote in my review for Wendy and Lucy that she shoots uh, Walgreens in the way that like reminds me of waiting my waiting for my mom in the parking lot uh, when I was a kid, and it just kind of hits home. Um, Michelle Williams is in it; she's fantastic. Kelly Reichardt's actual dog is in the film, Lucy. That's actually Kelly Reichardt's dog. So really cool, lovely film. I think it's um, one of those films that's for any any gender, any person. It's not uh, for one specific audience. You know, it's just good stuff. Yeah, I definitely suggest people will check it out. Great. That's great. I know you've been, yeah, I've been uh, getting a lot of reviews from you. I've been posting them about a one a day is what I've been trying to do. Give it some time to, to breathe on the site. And uh, Wendy and Lucy will be up there probably next week sometime. Yeah, I, yeah, I think I have like three others in line before, so yeah. Um, I've been using this time to clean out my Netflix uh, list. I have, because I'm super anal about these sorts of things i have my netflix list organized by uh first it's tv shows that i enjoy that i like to throw on for a rewatch then it's tv shows i haven't watched yet then it's movies that i like to watch like rewatch you know then it's stand-up comedy and then it's just a shit ton of movies i haven't seen yet so i've been going through that one at a time knocking them off one a day and uh some of the recent ones i watched were uh, spielberg's war horse which was fantastic. I, I really enjoyed that. Yeah, that was up for Best Picture, wasn't it? Yeah, it was amazing. I found out the horse was the same horse that appeared in Seabiscuit. Oh, nice. What a career. Yeah, hell of a resume, that horse. Nice little <laughs> filmography there. Yeah. But it was just such a touching story of just like this horse going through World War One and finding his way home. It was a very touching movie. I liked it. That's awesome. Uh, I also watched It Happened One Night. Uh, that was a DVD from my family's house that was on Netflix, but that was very entertaining, very cute. Uh, I was watching it, and uh, my 15-year-old cousin walked in and asked me what it was, and I'm like, this is a movie from the 30s. Sit down, you'll learn something. <laughs> and uh, me and my cousin watched this movie, and we both got really into it, and we're like, you know, Gable, what are you doing? Like, t- you know, fight for her why aren't you t- talking to, to her like talking to you're saying you're in love you're saying you're in love with her you're telling that to everybody except her for fuck's sake man and yeah we just got really into it and we, i really liked it and it was really cute and uh now i've seen all three movies that took the big five at the oscars so yes yes three power powerful films yes indeed it'll never happen again i guarantee it i yeah I, uh, it's gonna be very hard <laughs> very hard you know, if Parasite had been up for some acting awards, it would have taken it. Yeah, well, would yeah, there, yeah, I, yeah, I don't understand that one bit, but we'll take what we can get, right? Yes. Uh, my most recent watch for Netflix was 2015's Cop Car with uh, Kevin Bacon. Yes. <laughs> I liked it. I, I don't think it went as far as it should have gone. That was my big beef with it. I. The movie kind of told us that Kevin Bacon was this evil, corrupt cop, but we never really saw him do anything to prove that. Like, I wanted to see him, like, you know, kill somebody or go through, like, do some dark shit, some kind of, like, you know, pulling somebody over and smashing their headlights, something. But we don't really, like, we're just told by everybody, oh, he's a bad guy. I mean, that's not, I think, you know, actions speak louder than words. Like, my example I was talking about, about it this morning was uh, Inglorious Bastards. If we are just told that Landa is this horrible Nazi who kill, like who is hunting Jewish families and is just, you know, an evil mastermind. If we're just told that, but we never actually see him do anything, he loses a lot of punch. And I think that Bacon lost a lot of punch because we never actually saw him do these horrible things. Yeah, I yeah, totally understand that. Yeah, but I did like the movie. I gave it a seven. I think that it could have been better, but it wasn't bad. Yeah. But uh, I'm in the middle, actually, right now, as we're recording, I'm halfway through The Rainmaker. It's a. Oh, dude. Yeah. (laughs) Great movie so far. I'm really enjoying it. 
one of my favorite titles of all time. The Rainmaker. <laughs> <laughs> so it's good. a yeah, it's a Grisham co- courtroom drama. So very heavy on the idealistic young paralegal who takes on the big business attorneys. <laughs> that was hell yeah. I did. Uh, yeah. Did I mention to you that uh, the, the Big Picture podcast, they did their top 10 courtroom dramas? Like yeah, you, pre- yeah, you were telling me about that. <laughs> yeah, it was really cool. It, it, ran, it ranges from the 40s to the 90s. You know, they, they finish off with a few good men, and it's just... Uh, that was oh, number one? Was, well, well, they didn't really rank them. They just went through chronologically, like, here's oh. the ones... Here's the ones that kind of stand out through the decades okay. because they're like, because they, they, they're like, look, we, we know, like, we're trying to choose not just based off of like our personal opinion and like what we like, but more like, you know, pillars, of, you know, like the verdict, like pillars of the, the genre. Mm, I don't like that. I don't like I don't like taking that stance. I think it's I much prefer talking about move, like top tens when it comes to personal preference as opposed to just. Oh, well, they Hollywood. loved them all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just, I don't like when, like, this is what we should like as opposed to this is what we do like. Yeah. 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 I'm much more, you know, like, I, I think that, uh, what's like a good courtroom drama? I thought The Judge from 2014 was, was very good. Yeah. That one was okay. I, I thought it was all right. Yeah. But I think a lot of people just kind of discounted it, said it was like a, mo- like a lifetime movie of the week. No, I didn't. No, it's not that bad. Yeah, <laughs> that, that, that's that's mean. <laughs> I think the courtroom drama kind of died in the 90s. Oh, yeah, that's what that was their point. That's why they finished off with a few good men. They were like, look, it's just uh, it's it had its time and place and it, it used to be a lot more popular. Um, They used to churn them out a lot more, especially with, yeah. you know, there are certain actors, you know, that just could really do that kind of stuff. It's just yeah, I don't know. Uh, I think that. I think the courtroom drama more has its place in TV nowadays. Uh, that's yeah. Just, that's that's just how I see it. Well, I think that um, today it's like if you're going to do a courtroom drama, it has to be based on a true story. Yeah, that's it's like the OJ. The it's like OJ Made in America or, yeah, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, or Just Mercy. Y- yes. Where, yeah, that's like a specific film. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah. Interesting, though. I uh, Courtroom dramas, I haven't, I'm not that well versed. I've seen a few of them, but uh, I'm excited to see more. There's a lot. I've never seen A Few Good Men, for instance. Yeah, need, yeah, that one's that's very good. Yeah, I need to work on that. <laughs> you like told, The Verdict, though, right? I love The Verdict. That's a fantastic yeah. movie. That's that's one that hits all like the tropes that you just wanted to hit, and it's bam, bam, bam. You know, just, well, just classic. To see Paul Newman is like a broken, disillusioned attorney. It's just it's it works because he's always known for playing such like larger than life heroic characters, and then to have this guy who's just like had his time. And he's broken, and he's down, and there's no way back. It's you root for the guy, you feel for it, and I like that. And to see James Mason is kind of a slimy scumbag lawyer. I, yeah, I thought it was great. Fantastic. Speaking of uh, what, what, what all TV have you been watching lately? I just finished uh, season two of Afterlife on Netflix. <laughs> Unbelievable. Ricky Gervais. I want him to get an Emmy for writing, for acting. The guy shows off his incredible range in this show. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Afterlife is a show on Netflix about a man, uh, Ricky Gervais, who loses his wife to cancer and considers killing himself until his dog saves him. And uh, he decides that if he's going to be miserable, everyone else in his life is going to be miserable, too. So he uses that typical Ricky Gervais wit and sarcasm to fuck with every single person he sees on his day to day. So it's equal parts hilarious, equal parts incredibly depressing. Yeah. Well, and, Ricky Gervais, Ricky Gervais, very good at that. Yeah, honing that at that in. Oh yeah. And in season two, he hammers it home, and I was in tears watching it. I was just sobbing in the last episode, and yeah, absolutely stellar work. Awesome, man. Yeah, for sure. And I'm also seven episodes into a rewatch of The Sopranos, which I cannot fucking talk about enough <laughs> such a great show that's great because i'm i'm nine episodes or ten, sorry 10 episodes in on a, my rewatch of the wire oh right on another hbo classic i love i adore the sopranos i yeah i think it's it's probably in my top five favorite shows of all time it's just um it's got the quality it's got the characters it's got the weird like weirdo david lynch dreamy aspects to it at times and yeah, it's got everything I love in it. And then James Gandolfini, maybe the best performance in TV of all time. Maybe, man. It's an argument can be made. It was weird hearing him. Like, I watched one of his acceptance speeches at the Emmys, and I did not expect him to not have that Jersey accent. 
he's like cultured New York. It was not at all what I expected him to sound like. It was so weird. No, the guy's the guy's wicked smart. <laughs> <laughs> but he is just yeah. Tony Soprano is one of the most brilliant TV characters of all time. I love the way the show is constantly obsessed with The Godfather. Everyone's always just like bringing up quotes from it and shit like that. I'm like, oh, this is like this is like what it, what happened in two. Remember two? Like that, <laughs> that's how they talk about it. <laughs> like, it's, it's fucking great. <laughs> uh, remember two? <laughs> Steven Van Zant does his Pacino impression to make them laugh. Oh, dude. I thought I was out. They pull me back in. <laughs> yeah, that's it. He's great in that show. Yeah. Yeah, fucking great. I, yeah, I adore The Sopranos. This is my second time going through it, and yeah, I, it's been a while too. So there's a lot of surprises. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, dude, it's good. it's it's a lot, a lot of content, a lot of characters to go through, and um, yeah, I I, I sincerely hope you because uh, I think The Wire is right there next to Sopranos and quality, like through the entire show. I, I'd say Breaking Bad's right up there too, right? Uh, just it's it's able to capture you each season without without faltering ever. And um, the the sheer amount of characters in The Wire, I think, would, would just grab you, uh, grab your attention, because I, I know how, how into you are into the, you know, the development of those kind of characters. And then the writing, the writing is actually, you know, did you know that, th- this is sad, The Wire... Uh, I, I don't understand this, but it only got two Emmy nominations, no Golden Glove nominations through its entire run, both just for writing. Uh, that's sad <laughs> yeah. because because there's performances in there from guys like Idris Elba and, you know, Wood Harris that are out of this world. So, uh, yeah, I, I hope you, you go down that rabbit hole one day. Uh, some of my all time favorite shows were never even touched by the Emmys. It's it's weird, like their criteria for it, for uh, for awards. I just, yeah, but, I yeah, yeah, but then like some of my favorite shows like Breaking Bad like has this trophy cabinet full of them, and I'm not gonna lie, I, I feel conflicted sometimes when I'm talking about Breaking Bad. Sometimes I'll bring up like, you know, however many Emmys, and it's like, do I really care? Do I really care? Because yeah, some of my favorite shows didn't touch shit. <laughs> yeah, I don't get it. I just when it comes to TV shows, I'm, I either like it or I don't. There's yeah. not a lot, a lot of middle ground. I don't care about awards. I just. I I care about quality. Yeah. And I think you and I, you know, how we feel about like the Oscars is so much different than anything because it's this event celebrating movies, not just giving out awards, but it's celebrating and honoring so many people. And that's why you and I love it because we love movies. So if it's a three hour show about movies, then we're going to watch it. Absolutely. Of course. That's why I watch the Globes, too. Yeah. Yeah. The Globes, we know like we've watched them together. Yeah. We we know they're like, you know, they're kind of like the, you know, the kind of little brother to the Oscars. But. Uh, they, they still have there's fun aspects to it. The Globes are they're the redheaded stepchild of the Oscars. <laughs> and the <Emmys. laughs> there you go. They're just yeah, they're trashy. Everyone's drunk and nobody really gives a fuck. Not even the people who win them. It's ridiculous. Yeah. A Golden Globe <laughs> acceptance speech is like, uh, thanks. And then they walk away. Yeah, peace. It's fucking ridiculous. Like, uh, I was. One of my favorites was I think Jim Carrey won for Eternal Sunshine at the Spotless Mind. And he walks up there and he's like, I'd like to thank the Academy. Oh, wait, no, never mind. Uh, I'd like, <laughs> like just to fuck with him. Oh, boy. Genius. Yeah. Well, uh, I think that does it for this week, folks. Stay tuned next week for David Cronenberg's The Brood. Sure to be another fucked up case of body horror. And remember... You think you know your friends, but do you? Do you really? Do you trust them not to kill you when you find a life-altering amount of cash? Just think about that. Mm -hmm.